Hi everyone and welcome to the Vid19 conference. My name is Julia Steele, the creator and host, and it gives me my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this fantastic conference and some absolutely fantastic speakers. It's a pleasure to absolutely welcome our first speaker to VID19, the wonderful Lynn Kazali. Lynn is an expert in new, newer ways of working, and in particular, how to make sense of this world that we're in. She's doing a fantastic session on adaptability is the capability, and she's going to take us through the 12 elements of what it means to be adaptable. And I cannot think of Lynn of a better message than right now than, than the one you're going to bring. Uh, Lynn is the author of six books. She's going to hopefully see some of them in the background there and we cannot wait um, for this session, Lynn. Um, for people that have joined, uh, feel free to use the chat, the q and A. I I will moderate as we go. Um, or it is great to see some fantastic people online, Lynn, from the USA, Washington, Sydney, a couple of very well known names in terms of Janine Gardner, welcome. And so Lynn, I will hand it over to you and uh, thank you again for, for being our very first speaker on VID19, thank you. Thank you and what a pleasure to be here and see you all in uh, one of the most crucial times where we need to be adaptable. Uh, I guess that saying of the world being cray cray uh, tends to increase over time, that feeling of change maybe being faster than we ever imagined or ever expected it would be. So today's topic on adaptability, how we change, uh, how the capability is not just learning individual skills, but how can we change? And how can we help other people change? Because I reckon perhaps the opposite to adaptability could be resistance uh, denial, um, avoidance, you know, not wanting to be party to the things that are going on, wanting to run away, right? So today in terms of adaptability, no slideshow, but a flip chart. So if you've got a piece of paper and a pen nearby, get a blank page out and I'll get you to follow along with me as we track these 12 capabilities that will help us adapt to the cray cray world we're in. So to kick off, let's just put a mark down the middle, divide that page in half and again and again. So we've got four columns. Now this could be engineering, mathematical activity for some people. Line down the middle and then divide the other two by two. And then we're going in thirds here. So that will make you a grid of 12. If you follow along, we will have a lovely capture of a map of these 12 capabilities. Now, the thing about adaptability is we not only have to do it for ourselves, we have to continue to evolve and change. But whether we're a leader, a parent, a sibling, a child, a colleague, we also have kind of a connection mm -hmm. or a connectedness to help other people and help other people change and adapt. So where can we start with it all? I reckon the first part is the topic of sense-making. So the first adaptability, sense-making. Let's pop that in here. Sense-making, the Institute for the Future said by 2020 that this would be probably the number one capability we'd need. And while these aren't going to be in any particular order, I do like to start with sense making because if we can connect the dots, which is what sense making means, then we're much better able to learn, to take information in, to communicate with people, to influence people. So if we can connect the dots, then we're sense making. Now we've already got a bit of this naturally as we grow up, we can work stuff out. So have a think. Where might you be on the scale from, say, zero to 10 as a sense maker? You'd have to give yourself a five, wouldn't you? Because that natural element of being able to work out what's going on. 
if you've walked into a bar or a cafe or restaurant and you see people and you can start to work out what's going on with them, perhaps looking at their body language, watching some of their hand gestures, we start to piece bits of information together and we make sense, we connect the dots. And sense making is also about working out what's the deeper meaning of what's going on, the deeper meaning of what's going on. If you've been watching any crime shows, you've ever got into something like CSI, you know, and they have the, the wall where there's the, the, you know, the victim and the perpetrator and they have pictures and they start trying to connect the dots. It's a massive sense-making activity. So here I think it's about working through a series of steps. How well can we make sense? Now, the godfather of sense-making wrote this incredible book, Sense making in organisations. It's pretty heavy. It's pretty heavy, but it's a very good read. However, I made things a bit simpler. Uh, making sense, a handbook for the future of work. So this has got lots of maps and techniques and tips in there on how to work out what the heck's going on and then decide individually or as a team what we need to do about it. This is what sense making is connecting the dots the deeper meaning, working out what's going on and making a decision about it. So on a scale, not to 10, you're at least a five. Is there somewhere you could go a bit further? How do you know whether you're a good sense maker or not? Okay, so that's our first one. Let's move on. Beautifully connected to sense making, listening. Great ears. Great ears for listening. And one ear with an earring. Listening's a little bit like driving, you know, but we all think we're above average drivers. But a bunch of people are really not good drivers. <laughs> we see it every day, right? Listening's the same. We can think that we're better than we actually are. And I love the work of Australian social researcher Hugh McKay. So he's written a number of books. He spends his time talking to people and listening to what they have to say. But his book, Why Don't People Listen?, explains it. He says we're kind of like in a cage, a cage made up of our beliefs and our values and our identity. And to listen would mean that our cage could get rattled, right? Our strong beliefs and systems and values could be challenged. They could be changed. And can you see then how if you don't listen, you're not able to adapt? The better you are at listening, at taking information in, processing that, understanding that, and then the connection to sense-making, the more likely you are to not only you be able to adapt, but then you're able to lead other people to adapt. So listening. It's, it is like being above average or thinking you're above average. So on a scale, not to 10, has anyone told you recently, hey, you're not listening to me? You didn't listen to me. You didn't hear me. Check out Oscar Trimboli's work on listening as well. His uh, podcast and his book called Deep Listening. Like not surface listening, deep listening. Scale of 0 to 10, where do you reckon you might be? Because I reckon at the end of these 12 capabilities, you're going to have a bit of a hit list of some areas where you could go and pursue more, find out some more. Okay, tick. Second one done. Beautifully connected. Learning is the next capability for adaptability. And if you are here now online, you could give yourself a good tick for this one, right? You're open, willing to hear some stuff, to learn, to be changed. I was working with a team recently of educators or trainers, and I couldn't believe how many of them were responding in the learning environment saying, oh, yeah, we've done that. Yeah, we've heard that. Yeah, we know that. And so their resistance to learning was so obvious, but not to them. So they were kind of blinded to the fact that they weren't learning. So if you think you know it, are you doing it? Think between zero and 10, how are you at learning? Are you kind of committed to exploring new things, trying new things? And if you're online now, live or watching the recording, give yourself at least a five. You're here. You're open to things. I'm sure there's some people who said, oh, I don't need that. 
close to learning, not so adaptable, hey? Learning also involves different styles, different ways that we learn, and the way that we, I guess, uncover how we learn best. Could that be resistant by saying, no, I don't learn like that? Well, how about being open to learning in another way? And I think we're seeing that in the environment where we might have to be doing more remote work, be doing things distantly, working with different cultures, working on increments of work, working in iterations. These are all new ways of thinking and working, and we're going to have to learn some of them. And that means us being open and therefore being able to adapt. Let's finish off the top line here. Collaboration. Julia mentioned the lovely Janine Garner and her wonderful book, From Me to We, and then her second book, which is called It's Who You Know. And Janine is an absolute expert in the area of collaboration. And I don't think you can adapt if you're not willing to hang out with other people entertain other ideas, participate, communicate with others. So collaboration's key. We know that. We hear about things like sports people who don't just say, I'm the winner, I'm the one. I love hearing Ash Barty, Australian tennis player. She's always talking about we in her media conferences. She's never just saying, I, me, I'm the individual. She's always referring to the team of people that are behind her, supporting her, helping her be the performer that she is. So collaboration, a big one, a big one, and finishes off our top row of the 12 elements of adaptability. If you can make sense of information and listen, they're beautifully connected, those two, and you can learn and you're willing to learn, and as well as that, hang out with other people, collaborate, communicate, participate with each other, then we've already set up a great, I guess, foundation or top level way of working with each other and being more adaptable, more responsive, more able to change when change is needed. Let's have a look at the next row down. And one of the areas, if you've followed any of my thinking, uh, posts, blogs, I'm pretty fond of facilitation. And I believe facilitation absolutely is one of our current day capabilities. Now, it has some history or roots, I guess, back in... Uh, decades ago where it was about more of community development and helping communities thrive and hey we need that more than ever today but it's also a skill that's very nuanced and can be used very well in the workplace so anytime you're running a team meeting gathering workshop ask yourself who's facilitating this is anyone facilitating this or are you all trying to just fumble along and use this so facilitation, write this down, it means ease, easy. So how are you as a leader making change easy? How are you facilitating change or adaptability? How are you removing impediments, removing obstacles for people? How are you facilitating that progress? Now, it could be facilitating a conversation with someone. It could be facilitating a group conversation. It could be facilitating an online session or an online communication and participation. Rank where you reckon you might be. Are you down the end of, oh, I don't want to do that stuff? Or are you right up the cocky end saying, oh, I've facilitated for years? Be careful. Mm -hmm. Time on your feet doesn't necessarily make you better. And you might have some of the old kind of cliche ways of facilitating. Beware. Beware. I think it's a skill we can continue to evolve and develop. So facilitation, making things easier, and it doesn't necessarily just mean meetings, it can be in conversations, it can be finding hacks, shortcuts, ways to get around obstacles and make the path of progress or the path of change easier for the people that you're working with. Any time of day, I'm thinking, how do I make this easier for people? Imagine the reverse, right? Oh, how do I overcomplicate this? And sometimes we're involved in... Hey, you know, you've been online recently on the phone trying to get something changed or get something fixed. 
And sometimes the systems seem very complicated and can take us a long time. And that's where I think awesome facilitation would help to find the easiest path. I was working with a postal um, provider and if you wanted to set up a corporate account, it used to take 18 days, nearly three weeks to set up a, uh, an account to do business with them. And they said, well, what's an easier way to do that? Surely it shouldn't take 18 days. So we had a look at each of those days, each of the steps, what was going on in those, and we ended up getting it down to two days from an 18-day complicated system the team facilitated that process, made it easier for the customer and were able to reduce that down to just two days. That's adaptability. That's a willingness to say, hey, this thing can change. This is complicated for our customers. Let's find a smoother, easier path. Facilitation, you can learn more skills, very nuanced, subtle. And I think it's important when we're dealing with people's uh, feelings, emotions, and the way they might be turning up to a workshop or a session. We can't just say, hey, all right, let's get started. We re really do need to look after people. Now, uh, goes very nicely with facilitation, and that's visualisation. Picture of a post-it note, probably one of the most common ways people visualise stuff. I'm doing it now. I am. I'm visualising now. So you don't necessarily have to draw pretty pictures. I'm just using some cards and a grid. The grid is all about sense making. How I'm going through it is some facilitation. And what I'm sticking up here and the tools I'm using, visualisation. Now, I'm a bit of a stationary addict, so I don't mind myself a marker or a post-it note. And you do get better results with better tools. Uh, and so I like to banish any of those crappy, you know, the green whiteboard markers in meeting rooms, right? When we all get back to work, just agree, yes, pledge that you will throw those rotten things out. They're so pale and wimpy. So we want something that's got a bit more boldness in it. Go for a black marker. You don't have to be able to draw, right? Visualisation could be mapping information out, mapping out a customer journey, a customer experience. It could be drawing a problem. A few shapes, a few arrows, a few words is all you need. And it connects directly to sense making. So Carl Week, the sense maker I talked about before, suggests that making sense requires us to make a map. And the beautiful story he shares from history is that a troop of, I think they were Swiss soldiers, were out marching on an exercise one morning. There they were out in the Swiss Alps and it starts snowing and they kind of lost their way. They couldn't find the path that they were on. So they started bickering, I think, trying to work out how are we going to get out of here? A little while later, one of them finds a map in their pocket. They get the map out, they have a look, they work out where they are, they get to safety. Turns out that map was for the French Pyrenees, not for the Swiss Alps where they were. So even though they had the wrong map, they were still able to work together, collaborate, make decisions and move on and find their way to safety. So the learning here is when you're visualising information and in the words of Carl Week, any old map will do. So don't worry about putting pressure on yourself. Oh, it has to be pretty or it has to be perfect or it has to be colourful. No, just anything else that's visual, which is known as a third point of communication, so we're able to see it as well as see the people that we're talking to, helps us understand, and that's gonna help people change quicker. If you're a change leader and you're not using visualization, then put, put yourself lower on the scale between zero and 10. How much do you visualize the information that you're working with or that you're trying to communicate to others? Next on our path, and it was great to see the current edition of Harvard Business Review is all about 
creating a culture of experimentation. And I said, great, because that's what this next capability is all about. Experimentation. Now we don't have to run one huge experiment. We can run lots of little ones. And we don't kind of even need permission sometimes. We can just be testing a few things out. It's what's our hypothesis? What do we think? What might work? And let's try that out. And a lot of people in their own business do this all the time. They're testing things out to see, does this work? Does that work? Does a customer need this? Will that work? But if we wait and don't run experiments, so for the perfectionists there, I hear ya, I see ya. If you're working on something and you're trying to make it perfect before you put it out there in the world, you're kind of anti-experimental. So we want to be pro-experiment, get more feedback earlier. Think of the lean startup movement. We can borrow the ideas from that and apply that to our work. Put a bit out, test it and see how it's going. Run experiments, use prototypes. You look at the old Dyson, right? All of their vacuum cleaners, now their hair products, hand dryers. And they talk about the hundreds and hundreds, thousands of prototypes that they ran, all of their experiments as they were working through each of those different versions. You know, a few years ago, they said, the future of vacuum cleaning is cordless. And everyone went, hooray. And now they're saying, or recently, the future of vacuum cleaning is bagless. Woohoo. And now they're working on uh, an air filtration system, uh, as well as all of their beautiful hair product uh, and hair um, ideas. So companies all around the world use experimentation. We can too. It's one of the quickest ways for us to learn and adapt. And it does this too. It gives us sense making, gives us evidence and responses and feedback of what's going on and how well it's going. The second row is nearly full here. This last one is improvisation. Now, if you've been to an improv show, you know, at a theatre with performers on the stage, usually they don't have a script and they make stuff up. Now, sometimes it's funny uh, and certainly some of the shows like Whose Line Is It Anyway on TV. But improvisation can also be serious and deep, emotional, quiet. It could be short form, very quick, but it can also be long form. And while I'm not suggesting you all get together as a troupe and start putting on a performance, what we can do is learn from improvisers because they adapt all the time. They've already got this worked out. So we can learn from them. Here's how it happens. A colleague, Patty Stiles, one of the best improvisers in the world, uh, here at Impro Melbourne, and she tends to travel the world, working with other improvisation groups, speaking to them, performing with them, which means she could end up, she's a Canadian living in Australia, but she could end up performing with a troupe in Berlin or a troupe in Asia, and she will arrive and have to start performing with this group and not even know who they are. But through the principles and practice of improvisation, the kind of philosophies that improvisers use, they're able to get together and start working together really quickly. And the fact they've worked this stuff out, I think we can learn from. When we've got remote teams distributed all over the world, why don't we borrow these principles and practices of improvisation? Plenty of it written down, lots of improvisation games that kind of strengthen the muscle of improv. And it's a brilliant skill and capability because it connects deeply to learning and it connects deeply to listening. And if you don't collaborate well, you'll end up with a shit scene. <laughs> and if you've seen the theatre sports way of impro, on stage, performers are there and they'll have some judges. And if the scene's not going too well, then they'll blow a horn. <laughs> And instead of the improvisers going, what, what, don't you mean I'm awesome? They just go, yep, yeah, again, off stage, start again. So their ability to adapt 
to not be deeply hurt <laughs> and to kind of pick up and recover and start again is something that's so resilient and they are able to work together in great teams. So if I was to dwell on something for longer here today, it would probably be improvisation. In fact, what we're creating here is a bit of a Google map. You can zoom in on any of these and go finding more about these capabilities so that we become more adaptable, we become more responsive. And I think improv, the ability to work perhaps with a group of strangers, work with very little direction, trust your capabilities, trust your instincts. And I love the work of Keith Johnstone and his book, Impro, which uh, talks about all of the things that make for great workplaces, but also some of the things that cause problems in workplaces. And status is one of them. So the book, Keith uh, Johnston's book, Impro. All right, we're nearly there. Is your chart looking full? If you're drawing along with the pictures, yes, good on you, Julia, thanks for that. If you're drawing, drawing along with the pictures, I praise you. I give you an extra round of applause, which is making you very clever and ingenious, right? This next capability is that of ingenuity. Now, sometimes people say, oh, I'm not creative, and I'll get to creativity in a moment. But ingenuity is a capability of using what you have and doing the best you can with it. Now, I've seen over recent days people sharing photographs of the stuff they've got in their pantry or in their fridge and saying, tell me what I should make with this. And that's being resourceful and ingenious and particularly some of the responses that come back on social media when people say, hey, you could make this recipe or why don't you try that? And so we're kind of tapping the cleverness of the world. So ingenuity is about being resourceful, being resourceful and being clever. And we've all got it. We've got the smarts. When we get a team or group together and we're trying to solve a tricky problem, work on a wicked problem, we're bringing our resourcefulness. Now, we might sit there and say, oh, there's no funding. Well, that's a classic improvisation block by saying, no, it can't be done. Whereas a capability of ingenuity would say, okay, if there's no funding, how else could we do this? What's another way? So I'm working with a team at the moment and helping them strengthen their ability to find answers, to find hacks and shortcuts so that we become more ingenious, able to respond to these tricky challenges and are able to solve problems better, I think, than we have ever before. So all of this so far might sound, hey, it's pretty on task. We're doing this. We're working hard. Lynn, what about the love? Hey, what about the love? Empathy. This is absolutely a capability of adaptability. Until you walk in someone else's shoes, as the saying goes, we don't really know what it's like. Empathy. In a way, empathy is pretty hot right now, and I hope it stays that way where we are kind and considerate. And if you think of a scale, where are you, not to 10, are you someone who doesn't give up about anyone else, so selfish? Or could you perhaps be way up the other end, at the extreme, where you are maybe a highly sensitive person, highly empathic, feel all the feels all the time. At times that can be quite overwhelming and we have to look after ourselves or look after our team. But in the case of empathy, working with a group of leaders in, uh, at Metro Trains here in Melbourne and uh, we were wanting to connect more with the customer. So after one of our leadership workshops, the leaders went down into the subway and interacted with customers. Yes. They left their desks and they left the workshop and they went out and saw real customers who were taking the train. And I think some of that initial um, discomfort, oh, what's it, going, what's it going to be like, you know, interacting with real customers? And what they came back with was some wonderful heartfelt stories, but also some rich information and rich data 
there was embarrassment at times about how people with disabilities hadn't been cared for or hadn't been supported or resourced. And then there were other great stories and insights that the leadership team were able to put right into their continuous improvement system and make brilliant changes. So if we're just staying away from customers, we're not able to see what it's like from their perspective. And think about that for your team as well, finding some empathy about what's going on for you. And if you're down on the lower end, you might be one of those people who jumps in with their story. You reckon you've had it bad? Let me tell you about my situation. Right? Not such good empathy. Improvisers would call that blocking or topping, is that I've done this and then someone goes, well, I've done this. Well, ours is better. No, mine's better. So we're playing this unfortunate game, not so good, definitely lacking in empathy. Nearly there. We've got two to go. Two to go. I mentioned ingenuity earlier and I said I would come to creativity and here we are. Here we are at creativity. Creativity. The light bulb, hey, that's one of those global symbols for, for innovation and creativity. Uh, and I was reading a book last year called My Inner Critic is a Big Jerk. <laughs> And it's true, right, because we can be the worst sensor of our creativity. The fact that we can block and say, oh, I'm not creative. Or thinking that creativity belongs in the arts, only in the arts, is very resistant. That's not adaptable. The World Economic Forum's been tracking over the years and you can see creativity keeps getting higher and higher on the list and how we can work in more interesting ways with each other, how we can come up with more creative responses for our customers and how we can lead more interestingly and more creatively. So if you don't feel you're so creative, like if you think you're down on the zero end, you might be surprised that you are blocking yourself or that you're resisting the possibility of being more creative than you are. There's plenty of exercises, books, resources on helping you generate creative ideas. Um, but one of the improv games that's a beauty is taking two things and connecting them. The brain can always do that. So a game you might want to play walking around the house is just pick up two things, connect them and make a third product or make a third object out of that, just out of your mind. If you're sitting down waiting for creativity to strike, know that some of our best creative ideas come when we wake up, uh, when we're in the shower, right? So this, the research around it's incredible. The fact that the shower and the water tends to put us into this zoned out space and then a creative idea comes shooting in. But also we get great creativity when we're bored. And so if you find yourself bored or if you're not yet bored, make yourself bored. <laughs> <laughs> boredom will create for you. And uh, Elizabeth Gilbert's work from Big Magic and her TED Talk that's been viewed millions and millions of times attests to this, that creativity is everywhere, bopping around the world. And I love her idea that ideas may be coming to you and if you block or resist them, that idea will dash off to someone else. So if you've ever looked at something like a book or an idea or a project or product or a name and you've gone, hey, I was going to do that. I had that idea. Yeah, you might have had that idea for a short time and then that idea went off and landed with someone else and they executed on it. So it's a great, um, I think, inspiration or motivation that when you do get ideas, capture them because we're not so great at remembering them. So capture the idea in a journal, in an app, on a post-it, and then to execute on that. That's a capability, capturing the idea, and then the additional capability is actually putting it into practice, gathering creative ideas and doing something with them. Which leads us to the last one. You might be wondering what it is. It's curiosity. So while these might not be in any specific order, I did want to start with sense-making 
And I did want to finish with curiosity. On um, LinkedIn recently, I was posting about curiosity and in the face of perhaps being swamped with uh, the media at different times, we can take in too much information because we've got a thing called a curiosity bias. Us humans, we love looking for information, gathering information and soaking it up. And so if we're doing that too much, there's a danger that we get overwhelmed with information. We get overwhelmed with data and then what do we do with it? We're too swamped to kind of be productive and be capable. So when it comes to curiosity, we want to be wondering, but then we also want to know when is enough enough? When is enough information enough? How deep do you have to go on a topic to know that you've got enough? If you keep looking for the perfect answer or the perfect resource or the perfect research, you'll never get there. It's a bottomless pit. So know that your curiosity bias could kick in and you will keep looking for information. But our curiosity is also the avenue where we can change and we can learn things and test them out and as a result become more, better, calmer, improved, a greater person. Curiosity, I saw implemented recently with a, a team who were wondering why some stuff was not working and they used the approach from Kaizen, K-A-I-Z-E-N, with the five whys approach. And so whatever happened, they just asked why did that happen and why did that happen and why did that happen and they went on and asked those five whys. A well-used technique in a lot of businesses. You can use it yourself in your own world in your own community, in your own business or practice, and in your team. But that's an activity. So I would run that and then, like, get the heck out of there. Get the heck out of that information and curiosity. Don't drown yourself in it. Which I think now leaves our 12 done. So we have curiosity, creativity, empathy, ingenuity, that cleverness. We've got improvisation, experimentation, visualization and facilitation making things easier collaboration together learning listening and right back to the start sense making and i reckon there could be something that sits above yes am i saying there's a 13th one possibly let's see there is i think there's something that sits above all of this and it's the danger we can have when we get overloaded with information. So cognitive load coping is a thing. <laughs> we know information overload is a thing. And from some of the research and data, we can see we can get overloaded with information that can happen quickly or rapidly, say in the case of uh, a lecture or reading a report or watching a bunch of sessions on uh, an online conference. But we can also get overloaded gradually over a period of time. And you'd know this if you've finished a day of work or perhaps you've been at a conference and you've been constantly taking in information and then at the end of the day you like feel like a zombie. People report that, don't they? Right? You say, oh, my God, I feel like a zombie, or I feel brain dead, or these other sorts of descriptions. And that is the feeling of cognitive overload, but it's happened gradually throughout the day. So here's the tip. Make sure you release the pressure, like a champagne cork popping, right? That we need to, once we've taken information in now, give yourself a couple of minutes. Get up, walk around, look at something different and release the load or the pressure that you've been putting your brain under. And this goes for if you're working at home, or you're presenting information to me, to people, make sure you're giving them some places where they can release the pressure. All the way along here, these have been little gaps where you've been able to release the pressure of each of these topics. But then we've also got a kind of pressure bubble around this whole hour. And then at the end of it, psh, we release the pressure on that and then get ready to focus on the next thing. 
So if you want some more information on cognitive load or these 12 things, just shoot me a message, linkazaley.com. Happy to send that to you. I've got some free reports on sense-making, facilitation, visualisation. There's plenty of places for us to go deeper and explore any of these capabilities and to also see how we can connect them and combine them to build our own capability so that we're more adaptive, we're able to respond in ourselves, that we're less resistant, and therefore we're able to lead better change, more adaptable people in the teams and the communities and the families in which we're a part. So there's your 12 and a bonus 13. Lucky for some, cognitive load coping. Let's release the load briefly and I'll check back in with Julia to see if there's any specific questions that have come up that we can uh, answer right now. Thank you, Lynn, giving you a uh, oh. virtual round of applause from this end. We have a couple of really lovely questions come through on the yep. chat um, and Q&A. So I'll start with one from Leia who asked, facilitation sounds great, but some staff live quite comfortably in their quiet area. How are you able to reverse this situation? So in their quiet area. So yeah. you've got people who are more introverted or isolated. Uh, so being part of a big group facilitation can be quite uncomfortable. And so that's why you might want to use a technique that, you, that a facilitator might call breaking down the group where there's more intimate conversations. So, of course, the most intimate would be an activity that you would let people do alone. So that's think this, write down that, capture these personal ideas. And then the next level of intimacy would be talking to someone else. So I think you can step up that from being alone, gradually build what I call ramp engagement. Don't, don't go engagement really steeply. Uh, that freaks people out. Build it very, very slowly and safely. Uh, and I find sometimes even the most uh, quiet, resistant, deep thinking, uh, chin stroking analysts will want to participate. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much. The next one is, and this one is a really front of mind for me today, given my stepdaughter is here with me yes. at home. She said, how do we promote creativity in our school lessons? Yes. How about, uh, what is it? So Ken Robinson's TED Talk, like the most watched TED Talk in the world about how schools are killing creativity. Uh, so it's not just on a teacher to do that. It's also on the child and the environment that they're being brought up and being allowed to be creative. Um, I certainly remember um, being creative as a child and having that sort of stifled. I think we've all had that experience of for a, an elder standing behind us and judging the work we've done. And that's one of the things that really stifles us. So if you cannot pass judgment, uh, and that's part of the Carol Dweck stuff around a growth or fixed mindset, that if you can uh, be less judgmental around the quality of stuff and more encouraging about the effort that's been put in, um, that's certainly something that helped freeze it up. And I love, I love it when learning practitioners or teachers come along to visualisation uh, workshops um, because they're saying, I want to bring more of this into the room. I want to be able to present information in a number of different ways. Um, I've, got, I've got your um, visualisation book, Lynn. It oh, yes. worked wonders for me in my, oh, cool. in my workshops because uh, as a classic left brain person, it was great to bring some, some creativity into, oh, cool. into my sessions. And Chris Meredith had the same, a similar sort of question, saying he's fascinated by the idea of visualisation as a way of improving adaptability, but it seems yeah. scary. Any tips for starting? What situation does visualisation work best? What types of yes, issues but... lend themselves to visualisation? Great. What situations and some tips? So if we think of how visual management, you might want to start with that, how you might go about visually managing something. So if you've used a Kanban board or any type of whiteboard where you have information, numbers, um, I was visiting the Environment Protection Authority. They've got TV monitors that are representing information, greenhouse gases, temperature, water usage. That's visualisation. 
So it doesn't mean we have to stand up with a marker and visualise, but it could be how are we bringing visuals, which could be photographs. Take your own, right? Bring your own photographs. It could be sketches, but it could also be this is visualisation. I'm just sticking a card with something that I prepared earlier, like 10 minutes before. Uh, <laughs> That sort of pre-preparation. So I don't want you to think that you have to stay up all night, you know, preparing some beautiful piece of artwork. Think about other sources of visuals that you might be able to share as a first step. And then the next step could be partially preparing bits. Uh, and then I think the third step is drawing some stuff live. Remember the spotlight effect, which is where we're more critical of ourselves than others are, where we think people are paying more attention than they actually are and they're not. So even though my inner critic is giving me hell, right? It is giving me hell about this, about how stuff's not written well or it's crooked. I'm just saying, shut up and I'm carrying on. Thanks very much, but I don't need you right now. So That's start the... low, start with logic and you're probably better than you think. That's a really nice segue into the next question from Sarah, Sharon, who says, what, what's your advice about balancing mastery with good enough? And I know you're an expert in ish. So you want to talk about ish a little bit? Yes, yes I will talk about ish, uh, which is my, uh, the book I've written about perfectionism and the problem we have. And that often the standards we set for ourselves are way higher than what's actually required. So find out what the standard is that would be tolerated or that would be allowed uh, or that's possible and then you'll save yourself a heap of work, a heap of working towards perhaps just a deadline. And I think this is one of the biggest issues with quality is that we set deadlines of time and not standards of quality. And so we keep working and working and working to the deadline and we may have surpassed the quality that's needed. So going for good enough, as I mentioned with the spotlight effect, you know, it's often way better than we think. And I see this all the time when I'm working with people visualising and facilitating. They're way more critical of their stuff and it's actually really good. So we're distorted, you know, we're distorted judges of the quality of our own stuff. Magic. Thank you, Len. The next one, we're, we've got a few more questions to go and then we're done. The... Um, next one is curious which of the capabilities you will be leaning more to, into as people navigate the impact of COVID-19. Yes. Oh, they're all good. Personally, what I would be leaning into is empathy and uh, just slowing down, right? Slowing down. And then personally, it depends how much sense making I professionally need to do. Like I'm not out there searching for a um, cure. That's not my job. <laughs> but if there's a way that um, I can feel better for myself and for others, it would probably come into to empathy um, and, and collaborating with others. So, you know, being uh, locked down in homes means we're hanging out more with people in our life that we're perhaps not used to spending so much time with. Perfectionism can creep in. Uh, I like to talk about dishwasher stacking as an example. <laughs> um, so we need to be empathetic around uh, our collaborations. Uh, perfect. I think, um, yeah, it's great to see actually a lot of leaders around the world leading into empathy yes. and a lot of the messages coming out of the World Health Organization around, you know, focus on the facts, not the, not the fiction. And yeah. uh, yeah, there's a, it's very easy to get caught up, as you said, in that cognitive load mm. of, of the amount of social media noise and um, news stories. It's fabulous to sort of see some of that empathy coming through Lynn so I think I think you're you're spot on so I think we are all oh sorry one more question just came through can you please help me understand the best way to differentiate between ingenuity and creativity yes I would say ingenuity is being resourceful so is using what you already have being clever with what you have so it's a little bit like I think it was the Apollo uh, team that needed to uh, be slingshotted back to earth when they're on their way to the moon. And so the um, resources that were available 
to the team in the spaceship were emptied out onto a table to the people on land and they were working out with the resources they had, how could they solve the problem? That's ingenuity. To be creative, we might go, okay, well, what, what's possible? How might we do it next time? Um, think of ingenuity as the constraints of the resources that we have available to us. And if you were a leader, Lynn, um, in an organisation right now, how would you introduce some of these capabilities into your, to your team or your, your organisation? Yeah, I'd be modelling them. So I'd be doing good listening. And a great technique from facilitation is known as validating. So it's listening to what people have got to say and not correcting them or not trying to dismiss their thoughts uh, or their feelings. This is one of the biggest things that leaders do poorly. They try and deflect uh, because the emotion can be so intense to deal with, but you've kind of got to take it and not deflect it. Um, take it, validate that that's a big thing, um, and then, then I'd be moving on. What I'd probably do is also visualise. Why not listen to some of the stuff people have got to say, capture it, because visuals also validate for people. Visuals prove that you've heard what people had to say. Rather than, rather than going, oh, I hear what you're saying, but that's one of those old cliches of facilitation. Lynn, thank you so much. We are all out of questions. I have to say this has been a magical first session. You could not have opened our minds more in 12 ways. Um, my, my own notebook is um, absolutely full of things and I, will, I won't share my scores, but I will uh, certainly contemplate, contemplate them. Um, for people that are listening, please fill your chat with love for Lynn Kazali. Um, and check out any more of her work and her books on lynnkazali.com. This has been a perfect session for to segue into our next event, which starts at 10 o'clock. It is the world's biggest whiteboard. So if you want to leave a message of support, please jump on, regist we'll register and jump on. Um, I'm collecting inspiring quotes, comments from people around the world. It's got visualis visualization in it, facilitation in it. I'm going through your 12 things, Lynn. <laughs> sure. Collaboration in it, improvisation, empathy. It's got everything in it. So um, thank you again, everyone, for joining. Um, if you are keen to register for other events, uh, day one to three are available on vid19conference.com. We'll be releasing day four um, at the end of today. So please keep an eye out for all new speakers and uh, please share with your network so we can help as many people as possible over the next 19 days. So thanks again, Lynn. A round of applause to you. Absolutely loved it. And uh, talk to you very soon. Okay. See ya. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye.